Hi, everyone. Uh, thanks for tuning in. This is Sarah Huckins, Partnership Manager for Island Press, and I am excited to welcome you all today to today's webinar, uh, Feeding Our World, Combating Food Waste and Unequal Access. Today's webinar is put in on in collaboration with Purdue University's Agricultural Economics Department. The Ag Econ Department covers a wide array of issues from development, trade, macroeconomics policy implications, agribusiness, production and consumption, all the way to environmental and resource issues. Um, our two panelists today are professors within the department and are contributors to Island Press's newest food title, How to Feed the World. We are also lucky to have Jessica Eyes, co-editor of How to Feed the World, as our moderator today. And so we have our panelists here. Um, in addition to co-editing How to Feed the World, Jessica co-authored the Communication Scarcity in Agriculture. Jessica is Ross Fellow in the Purdue University's Brian Lamb School of Communication doctoral program and formerly served as Director of Communications for Purdue's Department of Agriculture Economics. Before joining Purdue, uh, Jessica served as a new media specialist in DC and as an international media consultant. We're excited to have Jessica as our moderator today and look forward to the conversation with our panelists. Um, but before we dive in, here is just a quick look at our agenda uh, for the webinar. Jessica will say a few words and introduce us um, to our panelists. Then Ken and Jerry will provide some background uh, to their work. And after their presentations, Jessica will lead a discussion with our panelists on methods of achieving global food security. Um, at the end of the webinar, we will be taking questions from the audience, so we encourage you to participate by entering in uh, a question via the GoTo platform. Um, in the GoTo toolbar, there's a section for submitting questions to our panelists. Um, we'll also be offering a 20% off discount code for how to feed the world, so stay tuned at the end of the webinar for that slide. Um, but for now, I will let Jessica take it away. Thank you so much, Sarah. It's a pleasure to be here uh, running this webinar. And um, I'd like to, before we get started, introduce um, our panelists for today. I'd like to start with Dr. Ken Foster, who is my co-editor of How to Feed the World. And Ken just returned to us from a sabbatical in Pereira, Colombia, where he was doing some research on um, cacao. And he is a professor of agricultural economics at Purdue University, where he teaches agricultural price analysis and applied time series analysis. And um, Ken was the department head for the Department of Agricultural Economics from 2008 to 2017. And he is a chair of the National Association of Agricultural Economics Administrators and has been recognized nationally for his teaching graduate mentorship and outreach activities. And our second panelist is uh, Dr. Jerry Shively, who is currently the Associate Department Head of Purdue's um, Department of Agricultural Economics. And uh, Jerry conducts nationally and internationally recognized research on agricultural developments and the environment. And his research focuses on the links among poverty, land and labor use and natural resource management in developing regions of the world. So I'm very pleased to have both of them with us um, today. And before we get started, each of these, our panelists is going to give us a brief summary of the topics that they're covering in today's webinar. And Ken is going to be covering food waste and Jerry is gonna be focused on unequal access. And then we're gonna have a discussion of how the two um, interrelate together later on. So let's get started with um, Ken. Hey, uh, thanks for having me on the program. And um, so I'm gonna talk a little about the chapter that I wrote in the book, How to Feed the World. Uh, and, that, and that chapter was related to food loss and food waste. And, and I think just the way everyone's appetite on this subject, it, it's, it's useful to talk about the scale of that problem. Um, and, uh, <clears throat> You know, even I was surprised when we started writing this that that uh, statistics like in, in 2010, the estimate is that 33% of the calories 
that are delivered to uh, retail units in the United States are lost. Um, and, uh, and if you count those calories up, which my wonderful graduate student uh, helped me do, uh, you find out that uh, that's enough calories to feed a person on a 200 calorie per day diet for 500,000 years. So, so it would be easy to conclude right now that we could solve the problem of global food insecurity if we would just collect all this, uh, all this lost and wasted food. But um, I think it's important uh, to recognize that some of this food is not salvageable. It's, it's spoiled. It's, it's just not edible. And I think it's also important to point out that we're just counting calories here. We're not counting a balanced diet. And, and all of this food tends to accumulate in particular places, these food losses. They're not distributed around the world where maybe the needy people um, live. So it's, it's, it's not a panacea here. I'm not proposing a solution to everything uh, in this chapter, but, but it is a sizable problem. And, and you know, it's, it's not just a problem of food insecurity with almost 16 million households in our country of the United States with insufficient food. Um, but it's also a, an environmental problem. The EPA has estimated that, that uh, food waste is the sing single largest contributor to our landfills in the United States. Um, and maybe expanding the scope a little bit because we, we tried very hard in this book uh, um, to speak to a broad audience, not just uh, you know, people in the United States. And so we tried to bring in uh, information from the rest of the world. And if we looked at developed countries, um, we found that more food um, is lost in developed countries around the world than is produced in all of Sub-Saharan Africa. Um, so again, a, a, a grand, huge problem. So, so that's kind of on the supply side. Um, and we look at the world from the demand for food security, uh, almost 800 million persons who are chronically undernourished around the world. So, so it's, a, it's a big problem, both in terms of how we handle our food, how we treat our food, but also, um, you know, it's a, it's a huge social problem that we're addressing. Um, and, I don't, you know, I don't want to um, ruin the suspense of reading the book too much, but, but in the book, we talk about you know, how these uh, losses and wastes are distributed around the world, how they happen uh, differently in different parts of the world, how they happen differently in different um, economic circumstances within households and across countries. Um, and and for, for those of you who are interested, or those of us who are interested in taking action and, and having uh, courses of action, we spend, spend quite a bit of time in this chapter talking about how we as individuals uh, might interact with uh, our food consumption patterns and our behaviors, uh, um, doing things like uh, preserving food or repurposing food, um, as well as how our communities might react and how our governments might react um, to what is really a sizable problem, an important problem uh, that's related to how to feed the world. Great. Thank you so much, so Ken. We'll have some opportunities to talk uh, in more detail about that. Definitely we will. We'll be exploring that um, further as we go along. And um, Jerry, if you want to jump in now and give us a brief introduction um, onto your topic. Sure. Uh, good afternoon, everyone, or good morning, uh, good evening, depending on where you are. Uh, really happy to be part of this today, and thank you for the invitation to join you. Uh, let, me, let me begin by saying that although I'm speaking mainly today to the issue of uh, achieving equal access to food. Uh, those who are interested in this topic really should um, consider picking up a copy of the book because uh, across the 12 chapters, we touch on almost every aspect of the food system, uh, stretching from land and water to changing climate to the role of technology and food systems. There's a chapter on trade. Uh, of course, there's a chapter on food loss, uh, as, uh, as Professor Foster just alluded to. Um, there's also a chapter on health and um, information. So there is uh, you know, a wide set of observations and, uh, and experiences cataloged in the book. Uh, my own contribution focuses primarily on smallholder agriculture. I've spent the last two decades uh, studying the problems of farmers in marginal areas of the world, primarily in South Asia and in Sub-Saharan Africa. And so my perspective 
on the the issue of equal access to food uh, largely focuses on uh, areas where people produce much of the food that they consume. And those problems are quite different from the problems that we might uh, observe in a developed setting, such as the United States, where access to, to food isn't always about access to the means of production, but rather to um, uh, income or to markets that provide nutritious food. And one of the things that I would like to underscore at the start is that although we often use food as a kind of um, general uh, descriptor of the, the problem that we're interested in or the issue that we're interested in, uh, we should be careful to think not just in terms of calories, but also in terms of uh, balanced diets and indeed nutritious diets. Uh, because nutrition is really, at the end of the day, the thing that's important, um, so much more important than simply consuming calories. Uh, the other thing that I would sort of add as, as a way of introduction is that um, uh, to, to provide a little bit of truth in advertising, I suppose, um, I'm, I tend to be a technological optimist. And I, I strongly believe that the only reliable way that the world's going to produce, deliver, and distribute better nutrition to the world's population is through the use of better technologies. And so if we're talking about access to food or access to more nutritious food, um, then we also have to think about access to technology, access to information um, as a way of delivering the means of producing and distributing that food. Uh, I see that there's a slide on the, uh, the screen that, that comes from my chapter in the book. It's a, it's a fairly simple diagram that, that just relates the total number of calories that people consume uh, on the horizontal axis to the percentage of, of calories that are consumed in what we would consider non-staples or sort of uh, uh, higher quality uh, nutrients. And as you can see in the United States, uh, between 1961 and 2013, um, we've increased our calorie consumption on a per person per day basis. Uh, but the, the composition of our diet in terms of the percentage of our diet that comes from staples or non-staples hasn't really changed much. And so as we get into the conversation today, I think we'll be spending some of our time talking about the problems of, of food access, food waste in the United States, and contrasting that with the experience of uh, countries, for example, in East Asia, Africa, South Asia, even South America, whereas the diagram illustrates over time there's been both a growth in total calorie consumption, but also a, a very fundamental change in the composition of diets. And part of that nutrition transition is still ongoing. You can see that in East Asia, uh, diet composition is starting to approach uh, similar to what the European Union um, might have experienced a few decades ago. But in Africa, we see that the nutrition transition is really just, just launching now. And as uh, we project forward over coming decades, diets in Africa are going to have to fundamentally change uh, and the, the means of production are going to fundamentally change to address those needs. Can I have the next okay. slide, please? Yeah, there we go. Yeah. Okay, the other, um, the other sort of piece of information that I'd, I'd like to uh, present that might help us think about the, uh, the food problem, if you will, across different parts of the world uh, is illustrated by this graph where I'm uh, plotting the food budget shares for 144 countries. And as you can see, in places like the United States, and of course in this graph, each dot represents a country with the USA at the uh, sort of high income upper left region of the chart, um, down to the Democratic Republic of Congo on the right-hand side, you can see that 
the percentage of total income that's spent on food uh, differs dramatically across the distribution of countries. Indeed, in the United States, we spend less than 6% of all of our income on food, uh, whereas in a country like Malawi and Southeastern Africa, uh, approximately 50% of all income is spent on food. And so as we think about providing improved access to food, part of, that, uh, part of the solution to that problem has to be to increase the purchasing power for people who are purchasing their food in countries uh, on the right-hand side of that graph, but also increasing the, uh, the, the capacity to produce food because many people uh, reside in, in uh, rural areas and are themselves farmers. Great, thank you, Jerry. Um, so I appreciate both you and Ken giving us um, a brief overview of your topics. And um, to get us kicked off, um, I'd like to ask a question that's directed more towards Ken. And I think that this is a particular differentiation that we need to have quite clear as we move forward, because it really does highlight the issue of food inequality, and that is the difference between food waste and food loss, which are actually two very different um, phenomena. And before we get started, I think we'll have Ken go ahead and give us a, a clarification on that subject. Yeah, uh, if you could put up the slide with the graphic about where and how uh, food losses and wastes occur, that'd be great. Um, so, so this is uh, just a graphic that relates uh, food loss and food waste across two different uh, parts of the world. Uh, one is South and Southeast Asia, the other is North America and Oceania. So in the first case, think of you know, Thailand, Vietnam, India, Nepal, uh, places like that. In the second case, think of the United States, Canada, and, and Australia predominantly. Um, and so when, we, when, when I make the distinction between food waste and food loss, um, it, it really comes down to where um, the phenomena occurs along the supply chain. That's the, you know, the, 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 the long process from the time a crop is planted until someone eats the food that's made from that crop. So um, looking at this graphic, you can see that, that in this lesser developed part of the world, South and Southeast Asia, um, there's far more loss uh, in the production and storage stages of the supply chain. And so, so when these things happen early on, we think of uh, weather events maybe that destroy a crop in the field before it's even harvested or, or losses during harvesting because of the lack of good uh, harvesting technologies um, or, in, or in storage because of uh, pest infestations and, and things like that. And if we look at the more developed part of the world, uh, North America and Oceania, uh, we noticed that in fact most of the the food waste occurs uh, in consumption. That means in the in the retail units, the grocery stores, uh, the restaurants, and uh, even more so in our homes. And so we call that waste, uh, and we call the the things that happen early in the supply chain losses. Um, and, and I think, uh, as Jessica pointed out, it's important to make this distinction, not because, uh, you know, one is worse than the other. I mean, they both contribute to global food insecurity, um, but, but more because um, the remedies are different um, or can be different. In, in, the, in, the, in the first case with uh, food losses, things that happen early in the supply chain in production and in storage, uh, it's really a lack of technology. It's not a lack of individuals wanting to uh, reduce these losses. So when we get into these parts of the world that are less developed, where uh, technology is more difficult to access, either because uh, individuals don't know about the technology or because they can't afford to implement those technologies, then education and access to technology and development of, of site-specific uh, technologies, technologies that function well in their location is the predominant remedy <clears throat> when we get in more developed parts of the world or uh, in general uh, with food waste and food, food losses, um, it's about people's behavior predominantly. It's partly about education. It's about things like understanding 
uh, that uh, the use by dates on a food product um, uh, don't mean that the product is is unsafe to eat. Those aren't food safety warnings. Those are uh, if you use it by this date, then you're going to use it when it's still in its peak quality. And if you use it after that date, then then the quality goes down. So so it's about education to a certain extent, but it really is more about our behaviors, uh, predominantly in the developed part of the world, that uh, help us remedy uh, food waste issues. I hope I I hope I answered your question, Jessica. If I didn't, then you did. prod, prod me some more. <laughs> no, you did. You did a great job, and um, I appreciate you clarifying how how on one in one region you see such a clear differentiation between regions where these two phenomena occur. So food waste primarily occurs in these wealthier nations and food loss occurs in generally speaking poorer nations where there's um, lack, of, lack of technology. But you don't definitely don't see very much food waste occurring in um, in these poor countries, would I be correct? saying that Ken? Oh absolutely I mean if you think about it you know people who um, people who um, have have meager means um, to buy their food that food is precious to them so it really is about you know the relative purchasing power that we have in developing countries and maybe it goes back to Jerry's uh, slide a little bit you can see you know uh, where here in the United States we spend less than uh, than six percent of our wealth on on food <clears throat> other parts of the world where they're spending, you know, upwards of 60%, uh, that's a huge difference, right? So when, you, when you're spending more than half of your income on, on your food, uh, that's a precious item. You're not gonna let that waste. In fact, uh, you're probably gonna eat it at times when, uh, when it's well past the use date. Um, and uh, so, so, yeah, it's, it's, it, it is about, uh, it is about uh, you know, this issue of access and affordability and relative affordability when it comes down to food waste, really. Great, thank you so much, Ken. And now to get, um, to move us along, I'd like to ask both of you, Jerry and Ken, if you could share a specific example of your topic area for our listeners so we can make an immediate connection to this issue and we can see how it, how the bridge between um, this the, con the conceptual and an actual occurrence. So. Jerry, if you wanted to get us started, if you could could provide a specific example of food inequality that you've observed and you've discussed thus far in sure. your work. Sure. Uh, thanks, Jessica. And um, I just I just sent a link to um, Sarah, and I think she's distributed it to everyone who's on on the program today. Uh, it's a link to a website that the uh, Economic Research Service of the U.S. Department of Agriculture maintains. And it's a research, um, a, a research tool that provides a map of food access. Uh, some, of the, some of you may be familiar with the concept of a food desert, a uh, food desert defined in various ways as a, a physical location in which um, People do not have regular access to um, a, a reliable, nutritious source of food, maybe because they live in an urban area where there isn't a grocery store uh, within walking distance, or maybe because they live in a rural community and there isn't uh, a grocery store within short driving distance. So um, is that link now available? Can, can everyone click on that? It is. It's happens. available to everyone down in the yeah. chat box. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So, so this map of the United States sort of highlights part of the, the issue of unequal access in the United States. Uh, even though we're a country of great uh, wealth and income and we're a net exporter of food to the world, uh, it's nevertheless the case that there are a lot of places in the United States where uh, people do not have access uh, uh, either within walking distance if they're in an urban area or within driving distance uh, in a rural area to a reliable supply of nutritious food. And this map that the USDA uh, has produced and maintains gives you a sense of where those food deserts are. And you can drill down um, and look at your own community. Uh, and so this is you know, a very clear illustration 
of the fact that access to nutritious food is unequal, even across our own landscape in the United States, where uh, we would think that that our our production and distribution systems would be sufficient to provide adequate nutrition to everyone. Uh, Great. Um, Ken, did you want to go ahead and share a specific example with us about the issue of food waste? Uh, sure. Um, so I don't know if everyone's grandmother used to say this when they would load their plate up and only eat half their food, but she used to say your eyes are bigger than your stomach. So, um, you know, that's that's an example, I think, of food waste that always sticks out in my mind. And where does that food go? Usually down the disposal or into the garbage. But um, but maybe a, maybe a better example in, in the context of, uh, certainly in the context of, of developing countries, and if we're talking about food waste, um, uh, it, it really comes down to, I think, uh, in, some, in some households, um, how we treat the used by or best used by dates that, that are printed on a lot of foods. And, I, and I'm not uh, contending that we shouldn't have those dates. I think, it's, I think it's great to have those, but I think a lot of us, um, unfortunately, treat those dates as food safety dates, and and after they've expired, we we treat that food as if it's not fit for eating, and that, and that's not what they were meant for. They're really meant to be a food quality indicator. Now, obviously, if we get weeks past those dates, then then probably um, food safety issues could start to arise, especially in 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 fresh foods like fruits and and meat. Um, but in general, I think uh, I think it's good maybe if we educate ourselves um, about what those dates really mean, and maybe that will help us uh, be a little bit better about uh, utilizing the food. Um, you know, if the food gets past the used by date, and you really want your food to be of best quality, uh, you know, that's the food maybe you need to start freezing and and use in your next soup, where you know having the the absolute best and most flavor in 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 a soup ingredient might not be the most important thing because a lot of those, those flavors get mixed. Um, so, I, so I think that's probably uh, an example that stands out to me. And, and we talk about the use by dates in the, in the book um, and provide a little bit of, of guidance, I think, about how to interpret those and treat them. Thank you. Um, food security is an incredibly complex um, topic and it is, it draws upon so many different factors. And often a lot of these factors appear superficially at least to be unrelated. And one of the things that we did with the book, How to Feed the World, was we attempted to draw connections between a lot of these different issues, such as water, climate, trade, technology, uh, that superficially might not seem so profoundly connected. Um, and so drawing on this theme of connection, I wanted to ask each of you to share how you see your two issues. And we've touched upon this briefly thus far, but to get a little deeper into it, how you see the issues of food waste and food inequality tying together, or if you wanted to also expand a little bit to mention other issues that are related to those that draw um, on a kind of a, a and interconnection. So, Jerry, if we can go ahead and start with you. Sure, thanks. Um, so, I'd like to introduce yet another dimension because I think if we try to connect uh, the issue of, of food access or e improved and equal access to food to food waste, um, that there's an intermediate step. And, and maybe one way to think about this is in the context of water, okay? So water is treated separately as a, as a chapter in the book, but in fact, it's a theme that runs throughout the book. Uh, as everyone knows, water is a crucial input to agricultural production. Uh, and it's also a cru crucial input to agricultural processing. And what people often don't realize is that water is extremely important in livestock production. Um, at the moment, Water is probably agriculture's most limiting factor in many places. Um, and if you look ahead uh, and, you, and you think about what the impact of climate change might be on agriculture and water supply, um, 
it's, it's likely the case that water problems are going to worsen, both because irrigated areas are going to have um, a disproportionate reduction in available water, and because over the same period of time, diets are going to be continuing to shift toward things that are relatively thirsty. So you think about fruits, think about vegetables, think about livestock and meat products. Um, they take a, a, a lot more water to produce than grain. Uh, if you go back to the, the graph that I displayed of, of food budgets and food, food budget shares, as people increase their incomes, their diets naturally gravitate towards more nutrient-dense foods. And often, as part of this nutrition transition, people consume more meat products, right? So if you just do a sort of back-of-the-envelope calculation, you find that it takes about roughly 1,000 liters of water to produce a kilo of wheat. And it takes approximately 10 to 15 times this, that amount of water to produce a kilo of meat, okay? So as diets shift from eating primarily grains to eating livestock products, including meat and milk, uh, there are going to be tremendous demands on the environment, land, and water to supply those calories and those nutrients. So how does that connect to waste? Well, obviously, in this situation, any, anything that we do to save or reduce the amount of waste uh, or the amount of food loss is necessarily going to help us deal with the constraint of water and, and other kinds of inputs needed for agricultural production. So as I think about sort of meeting demand over the next two to three decades as incomes grow in South Asia, as incomes grow in East Asia, as incomes grow in Sub-Saharan Africa, and people in those countries begin to demand more and more animal products. Um, one way that we can supply those is by increasing the amount of food that's being produced. Another way that we can supply them, and perhaps an even more efficient way to supply them, would be to reduce the amount of loss that occurs either in the production system or post-production uh, during processing, handling, transportation, and distribution. Great, thank you. Um, Ken, did you want to chime in? Um, sure, yeah, I think I'll, I'll take a similar tack to Jerry. I mean, we've already talked about how uh, people in wealthier countries tend to waste more food. Um, but but let me just hit on another uh, aspect that's covered in the book, and that's the idea of uh, international trade and the importance of international trade in addressing uh, both issues of inequality and issues of, of food waste. And, and international trade is hugely important. And Jerry talked about water. So, you know, we, we don't ship water around the world, but but we we do it sort of virtually or we will need to do it sort of virtually in a, in a more water constrained future um, in, in, a, in a virtual way. And by that, I mean, you know, production of, of food that is uh, water intense is probably going to congregate in places that have more access to water. Um, but for that to work and for us to continue to address issues of, of food insecurity and equal access to food, we need the ability um, to have international markets so that those food products can flow around the world to the people who who need them or who demand them. Um, and, uh, and, and the other thing about uh, about trade, it, it enables people in different locations to capitalize on on their relative advantages and their competitive advantages in, in producing specific things. So, uh, you know, in the United States, we don't have to produce everything that we consume as long as uh, as we can sell what we consume to other parts of the world and buy from those parts of the world the things that they're best suited for producing. So, you know, you mentioned that I just spent seven months in Colombia working on coffee and cacao production. Um, you know, we don't grow uh, uh, coffee in the United States. It turns out there may be parts of California where we can, but 
Um, but instead, we tend to take advantage of, of those advantages that countries like Colombia have in producing coffee. And we're able to do that because we have uh, access to international markets and trade. And, and this, is, this is something to keep in mind in, in the current environment where we hear a lot of talk about trade wars and, um, and tariffs and things like that, that, that those have real implications, um, both in terms of, of access to food and equal access to food, but also um, real implications about our ability uh, to address food insecurity on a global scale. Thank you. Now that we have um, done a brief overview of these topics and we've looked at some examples and interconnections um, between them, I'd, I'd actually like to ask both of you to explain how you might see a potential solution for your topic playing out or an ideal that we could envision um, for this situation. And of course, it doesn't have to necessarily be broad and encompassing the issue in its entirety, but something to put forward to give us an idea of how we might go about solving at least a component of it. Um, Jerry, if you'd like to kick us off. Sure, and, and maybe I'll divide this into two parts. Uh, let me talk about you know, addressing problems in the developing world and then kind of return to our our map of food deserts in the United States and say something about that. Um, so if you think about um, the challenges of, of creating um, cheaper and better and more nutritious food in the developing parts of the world, uh, you really have to attack that problem from the perspective of agricultural technology. And by technology, I mean in the broadest possible sense of the term, um, the the ways in which food is is produced. Um, just a you know a really quick comparison would point that that in a lot of say parts of uh, Europe, North America, um, yields for may, many of the crops that we're accustomed to to uh, looking at are are quite high. They continue to increase, but there are a lot of what uh, agronomists would call yield gaps in the developing world, places where the potential to grow crops uh, is high, but where current yields are still quite low. So for example, in Africa, you might find yields of, uh, you know, just maybe 10 to 20 to 30% of the yields that might be achievable in Europe or the United States. And one of the reasons for that is that the technology of production is still quite traditional and a lot of the, the genetics of improved crops, uh, particularly hybrid crops, um, haven't, haven't reached or haven't been fine-tuned for the African setting. So for example, if you go to a country like Ghana in West Africa, uh, it has some of the, the best land in the world for growing maize, but currently only about 3% of the land in Ghana is planted with hybrid varieties of maize um, compared with a place like Brazil where maybe 90% of maize is produced with hybrid seed. So just, just the simple act of improving the quality of seeds that African farmers have and perhaps pairing that with inorganic fertilizers that will boost yields on African farms um, would have a tremendous doubling or tripling of, of output on those farms. So in, in developing country settings, I still see technological advancement as the key to achieving uh, uh, greater food equality. If I shift my focus back to the map of food deserts in the United States, Obviously, the problem with food deserts is not that there isn't uh, high yielding varieties of crops being grown. Indeed, there are food deserts in many Midwestern states where in urban areas, people can't get access to nutritious food, but um, there's, there's plenty of farmland surrounding those individuals. Uh, so how do we solve the problem of food deserts? Well, it's not by uh, improving the variety of seeds that are grown in fields. 
Instead, uh, there's some innovative approaches that are being taken. For example, uh, here in the state of Indiana, uh, there's been the development of what are called mobile markets. So these are, uh, if you think about food trucks that might be delivering cooked food, instead these are food trucks that go into urban areas and they're like farmers markets on wheels that can roll through neighborhoods, make multiple stops. Uh, when I was a kid, there was a bookmobile that used to come to my neighborhood and, and the kids could walk onto the, to the bus and select some books. You didn't have to go to the library. And in the same way, in some urban areas uh, across the country, people are introducing uh, markets on wheels where people can get access to fresh fruits and fresh vegetables uh, if they don't have the, the, a way to get to the market. Uh, similarly, there's some very innovative uh, approaches to financing uh, and including some ways to create insurance for investment in urban areas where markets could be developed. Uh, and then, of course, urban gardens are, are um, another potential way to address some of the food desert issues, especially in, in uh, some of our major American cities. Thank you. Ken, can I pass it over to you? Yeah, thanks, Jessica. So, um, so again, uh, like Jerry, I probably need to address, you know, developing country issues um, that are focused more on on uh, food loss and and developed country issues that are more on food waste. But um, uh, and, and and I think my answer to a certain extent is going to mimic Jerry's when we when we go to developing countries and we talk about. Um, uh, food loss issues. It's it's really about access to technology. So the the food losses or the grain losses of an Iowa farmer, for example, are are a fraction um, of those of, of a farmer in a develop or a developing country. Um, predominantly due to the access to, to technologies, harvesting technologies. And one one of the things we have here at Purdue in the in the in the post harvest in the storage technology area, the Purdue improved uh, crop storage. Um, technology. It's a it's a hermetic bag, um, and uh, and it's and it's been incredibly successful at reducing post harvest losses in in Africa with crops like uh, maize and beans and rice. Um, so uh, historically, farmers who try to store um, those staple crops either for their own home consumption or for consumption by family owned livestock or poultry uh, might lose upwards of sixty percent of their crop during the storage process to damage from insects and molds. And with the, uh, you know, with the, a simple technology uh, applied to storage of these things, we can reduce those losses almost to zero. Uh, so, so technology, education about the technology, continued uh, really research and development into new technologies uh, is the ideal, I guess I would promote from the point of view of food loss. Um, when we talk about food waste, because this really has has more to do with um, the behavior of of individuals, I think uh, you know a, an ideal maybe that we could strive for is is a cultural shift in uh, in the developing world context where maybe we do a better job as individuals of internalizing and acknowledging um, that problem, uh, and and really I guess internalizing acknowledging that uh, there's a social cost to food waste. So, um, you know, one, we don't like to see uh, people suffering from malnutrition in our community. Well, many of the people who are suffering from malnutrition are not in our community. Um, they're somewhere else in the world. So we don't always, uh, we're not always exposed to that, but, but obviously hungry people um, are more likely to, to, uh, uh, you know, need to perpetrate crime if they are in our communities because they've got a family to feed. And, and I think if we found ourselves in their circumstances, we might do that too. But, but these social costs of, of hunger are, are, are difficult to internalize. So, so I guess I might point to, you know, sort of public service campaigns that have been reasonably successful in the past. Um, I remember, you know, when I was a kid, um, you know, Smokey the Bear, on TV telling us that only we could prevent forest fires. And so, you know, pushing us to take on a, a, a different cultural um, mentality towards, you know, forest fires in that case, um, 
the other one I remember, a great uh, public service campaign related to littering. Um, you know, panning across a beautiful landscape, uh, a Native American in traditional dress standing by the roadside, and all of a sudden some trash flies out of a car window, lands at his feet, and the camera pans up and 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 focuses on the tear coming from his eye. And it really harkens back to, I guess, our our sense of 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 what our country is or what we want our country to be, what do we want it to look like, um, and, and who we want to be as people. And so, so maybe we need some public service campaigns around uh, issues of food waste to help educate us, to help us internalize that as, as something that we as individuals want to take action on. Great, thank you so much uh, to both of you. And it looks to be right about 2.45, 2.46 right now. And so this is the part of our webinar in which I'd like to invite our attendees to look at your chat um, section and to submit questions to our panelists. Um, so that way we can, we can invite you to ask your questions and, and we can take advantage of having these experts with us right here. So go ahead and um, take a minute and submit your questions. And while you're doing that, um, I would like to ask Ken and Jerry to share with the audience how they think that listeners might be able to use our book to engage with their communities or how best they can use that resource. So Ken, if you wanna get started while we're waiting for our attendees to please go ahead and submit some questions through our chat function. Uh, yeah, sure. Well, I think uh, I think our book, one of the things, I guess, maybe to back up that we really strove to do here um, with this book was to write from a, a base of scientific knowledge, but for everyone. And so we've tried to make this book uh, accessible, regardless of one's past exposure to the material, regardless of one's, you know, I guess, base in biology, chemistry, economics, whatever the, the topic uh, might be. We tried to write in a style that, that made it accessible, made it readable, made it fun to read. And so I think you know, the book is, is well su suited to uh, um, reading by book groups for discussion, um, but maybe even uh, the, the community read environment where, you know, a, a city or a town adopts uh, uh, an intention to read a book together and then develop some events and activities and discussions around it. Um, so I, I, I think it's uh, I think it would be a, a great way to help bring some of these issues back to one's community, um, maybe even an avenue where somebody who felt passionately about about some of the subject matter could use it as, as leverage to make change in their community. Great, thank you. And so I see here we have a couple questions um, that have come in earlier um, through our question box. And Sarah, I'm going to invite you right now to help me read some of these questions out um, to our panelists. Yes, thank you, Jessica, for getting the question and answer um, rolling. So we had a couple come through um, while folks were talking, um, first of which um, is about um, UK and EU, um, how much of the conversation is about uh, intersectionality of food systems with racial, social, environmental justice, um, and and how do you perceive uh, the future of food with respect to the role of animal agriculture? Um, in terms of how can we feed uh, people on kind of a, the typical Western diet of meat and dairy? Uh, so this is Jerry. Uh, this uh, that of course is a an important question, and it's one that, you know, speaks to a, a variety of issues, not just uh, related to food production and food consumption, but but also to uh, religious beliefs, to ethical concerns, to philosophical concerns. Um, and so, I don't I don't think that I would try to to prescribe any kind of diet for any particular person. I think everyone makes his or her own choices about about that. At the same time, that, that, that's sort of an easy way to dodge the question, and I don't want to do that. Um, obviously, the way that Western food systems have developed, uh, 
have um, have to some extent prioritized in some settings animal agriculture uh, over other forms of, of agriculture. And I think that you're now starting to see uh, some of the realization of, of the, the negative aspects of agriculture, animal agriculture um, up here. And, and I think that Western diets are evolving and are continuing to evolve. Uh, beef consumption in the United States peaked some time ago and on a per capita basis has declined. Uh, and so I think as, as people begin to see what the true environmental cost of our food systems are, we'll begin to make informed decisions as consumers, and those decisions will continue to, to shape the landscape for what kinds of foods are demanded, uh, and then our, uh, our food industry will respond in kind. So I really see that, that um, our food system is something that serves the demands of consumers, and when consumer demand shifts, then uh, the food system will, will shift accordingly. That's not to say that we can't be more proactive and we can't find ways to improve efficiencies in our food systems and indeed to find better ways of, of doing what we're doing. Uh, and it's also not to say that there isn't a, an important role for education to, to speed um, the flow of information as well. So uh, I think it's a really important question. Um, obviously, trying to support uh, 9 billion people uh, or more on, uh, on a Western-style diet is probably not sustainable in the long run. Um, and so there will have to be some, some adjustments and changes made. Thank you. Um, Sarah, do you want to go ahead and lead us into the next question, please? Yeah, we have another one that kind of piggybacks off of that one. Um, we had a question about a, a shift towards a more plant-based diet, um, which we've kind of touched upon. Um, but they also were putting it in the context of um, organic agriculture and what might be the role of that um, in, in feeding the world in the future. Uh, okay. Yeah, uh, you want to take that? Uh, well, I can, uh, I can try. Um, uh, I, I think it's uh, it's it's not like Jerry's answer that uh, it, it will depend a, a lot on uh, technology uh, advances in technologies that will drive different uh, types of agricultural systems, uh, make them affordable. I think one of the things we have to be careful of is the balance between um, uh, prescribing. Uh, a particular agricultural system and uh, in this issue of equal access um, because uh, if, if we prescribe an agricultural system that uh, is unaffordable to large swaths of people then then we exacerbate that problem of, of access for for those people and we exacerbate some aspects of food insecurity um, I, I think uh, um, technology is hugely important because we're, we're still discovering uh, a lot of things, for example, the soil microbiome and how uh, plants interact with each other uh, in an inter interplanting environment. Um, and, uh, and, and we're discovering new things about uh, epigenetics, how plants express themselves in different uh, environments and under different situations and different stresses. And, and so, um, I think we need to be very careful. Um, uh, I'm not advocating for one agricultural system over another um, or against any agricultural system, but I think we need to be careful right now not to close doors um, on, on different technologies that could be vastly important to our ability to, to feed the world longer term. Excellent. Uh, thank you. And, and one of our other questions um, is about a case study of Ghana. Um, uh, attendee notes that a uh, major problem in Ghana is access. And so the question is, how do you get the food produced by small scale farmers um, from production points in, in rural areas to urban areas? Um, in that those transportation networks, um, how, how do you strengthen that and how is that related to access? 
Yeah, this is Jerry, and let me address that. Perhaps not in the context of Ghana, which which um, I don't know so well, but um, in the context of Nepal, a country that I've worked in uh, quite extensively and most recently uh, worked with the UN World Food Program uh, as a part of their earthquake reconstruction efforts. Um, Nepal is a, a country that's um, very challenging in terms of topography. Most people know it as a mountainous country. Um, there are pockets of, of individuals, communities that are living quite in quite isolated settings. And um, one of the things that is unmistakable in Nepal is that when uh, households or communities or children are living in areas where there's better transportation infrastructure, where there are improved roads, where there are better bridges, those link people to markets. When people are linked to markets, it means that as farmers, they can get their goods to market and receive higher prices. It means as consumers, they can buy food that's brought from other places at lower prices. It also means that people have better access to health care, better access to education, uh, better access to information. And all of those things combine to improve nutrition, especially the nutrition of children. And so I'm quite sure that uh, although I would not want to necessarily advocate that all investment has to occur in roads and bridges and transportation, that we also need to think about the food system as uh, something that depends on and relies on good transportation infrastructure. And therefore, we can't solve the access problem simply by focusing our attention on what's happening in farmers' fields or what's happening in urban markets. We have to make sure that we're also investing in the kind of infrastructure that links uh, communities, links farmers, links consumers, uh, and ultimately to return to the point that uh, that Ken made a moment ago at the, at the start of this uh, links uh, communities and countries to international trade because obviously uh, the, the best way to um, take advantage of the things that you do well is to be able to sell those things into international markets and uh, the things that you can't do well, you can uh, purchase from international markets. Thanks, Excellent. Jerry. Mm -hmm. Well, thank you all. Um, and thank you to everyone who sent in questions. Um, I'm sorry that we didn't um, get to all of them, but I want to be sensitive of time and just uh, give you all some logistical um, information before we sign off. Um, as you see on your screen, we have the discount code um, for how to feed the world. So I encourage you to explore the text um, more deeply with our 20% off code for feed. Um, we've also uh, included these slides as a handout, um, which you are welcome to download um, as, a, as a resource, but we will also be uploading um, this webinar recording to our website and so I will follow up with all attendees um, with that link uh, to our video page which will also um, have slides. So I want to make sure I give the final word to Jessica and our panelists but thank you all so much. Thank you Sarah and um, just a quick parting comment before we wrap up this webinar. First of all thank you again to all of you for joining and I apologize to those of you who submitted questions and we didn't have time to answer. And I, I do want to stress something that we, we stress in the conclusion of the book now to all of you is that feeding the world is going to be a, a challenge that is broad and complex and it's going to require a great diversity of skill and insight and contributions from a wide array of people. And all of us, no matter our background, our age, our geographic location and our skill set have something that we can offer towards this endeavor of feeding the world. And um, if you aren't sure of what that is, or if you're still trying to figure out what that is or what you might have to offer, I really recommend that you start with the process of educating yourself. And as you go about educating yourself, you might start to see suddenly where your unique skill set can come into play. 
So again, thank you very much to all of you. Thank you to Jerry and Ken for joining us and to Sarah for working so hard to pull this together. Excellent. Well, thank you all. Um, I will sign off now and then um, a brief survey will launch. Um, so we very much appreciate you filling that out and telling us what you'd like to see next time. Take care. <laughs>